this scripture will answer the questions and hopefully encourage us to move on out into a bigger and better life of giving. We're looking at the secret of the seed, and then this is the, probably the important part for most of us, the success of the seed, and they're both related. If you read the surrounding verses, and I encourage you to do that, that'll be your homework, um, you'll find that Paul is discussing giving, but giving to others. He's not talking about giving to support the ministry. He's not talking about uh, gifts that would, that would purchase ministry equipment or building or things like that, as, as important as those things are. He's not talking about support of the, of the resources of ministry. He's talking about giving to people, not tithing, but giving to believers who are in need. And it's very interesting. If you look at your King James, you'll find that the words, I say, but this I say, 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 6, are, not th- are in italics, meaning they're not there. So Paul didn't even write this, but I say. In other words, it's got nothing to do with his opinion or his view or his take on giving. He actually begins this with a demonstrative p- pronoun, tuto, but this is what he says. After talking about the need of believers and talking about the need of believers to get involved meeting the need of other believers, he just simply says, but this. It'd be kind of like pointing at something, or if you're looking at something you're reading, be like circling it or, under, or underlining it or highlighting it. He says, but this, the one sowing sparingly, sparingly also shall reap. The one sowing upon blessings, upon blessings also shall reap. Other versions, maybe your, your translation has generously, the one who sows generously. Another one has liberally, and that's the idea. If you'll notice, it's how we sow, not when or if. So the idea is it shouldn't be something that we have to consider or, or pray or fast till our pants fall down to, 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 to finally get it involved in doing this. This is something that ought to be part of our new nature, right? To give, to share, to sow, to meet needs. And that is really a law. If you've never uh, studied this out, it's quite fascinating. It's a law of sowing and reaping. And here's the important thing. I might be talking to somebody tonight who's downloaded this message or ordered a CD or may have just happened on us on Facebook or YouTube, whatever. But there are two, this, this law of sowing and reaping works in two ways. It works for sinners and saints alike. I'll be looking at this scripture again, but let me give it to us right now tonight at the beginning. In chapter uh, 6 of the book of Galatians, Paul has been talking there about giving, uh, but there it's for the support of the ministry. And this is what he says. This He's talking to believers, which is kind of sad. But he says, stop being deceived. God is not mocked. Do you know what that word mocked actually means? To turn your nose up. It means to turn your nose in, up in God's face. Stop being deceived, Paul writes. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man is sowing, here's another demonstrative pronoun, that shall he reap, meaning that and only that. That's quite fascinating, isn't it? For he that is sowing to his own flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that is sowing to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, Paul is not saying that we go to heaven or hell depending on whether or not we support the ministry. What he's doing is describing two different lifestyles. The the lifestyle of the unsaved person who, uh, who sows for himself, for his own benefit, versus a believer who sows for the benefit of other people. Paul does something very similar in the book of Romans. In chapter 8, he says, For, assuming you are living according to the flesh, you are about to die. Right? But if you, in contrast to that, by means of the Spirit, are in the process of constantly putting to death the sinful deeds of the body, you are about to live. So there again, he's talking about two different people. The unsaved person lives a certain way. The saved person lives a certain way. And depending on how they live, uh, whether they're believers or not believers, they're going to one of two different de- uh, destinations. Uh, you tracking with me tonight? So it's really, I really like this, the way the Scripture really interprets itself. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out the word. Just read it and read it in context. And I suggest if you have, have the, uh, the um, opportunity, look at it in several different translations. So there's the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the law of sowing and reaping set forth there very clearly. Now here's the secret of the seed. 
every one, Paul says, as he decides in his heart for himself in advance. So again, not if we sow into somebody's uh, need or when, but, but how. How do we do it? What's the right attitude of heart? What's the right, um, uh, what's the right approach to helping a, a brother believer who's in need? Uh, it's very important that we decide what we're going to do here. And we decide for ourselves in advance of the giving. Paul actually says, figure this out ahead of time. we got some poor saints. We want to bless them. We want your church, your congregation to be included. But you know what? Let's don't make it a last-minute deal. Think about the need and think about, each of you, what you'd like to contribute toward meeting the need. And then that way when I come, there won't have to be any discussion or whatever. We'll have it all sorted, and I'll just take it on my way. Now, this is totally voluntary, not obligatory. This is very important. This is, a, this is not God's uh, suggestion of the tithe. That's not what we purpose in our heart. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, one thing about it, uh, I don't have a home church right now. There's a mistake right there. We won't even go there. I don't have a church, home church right now, so here's the way I look at it. I just give my tithes wherever I feel like I want to. Sister Hope Nanny has a need, I'll give her my tithe. No, the Bible doesn't teach that. That's not right. The tithe is for the support of the ministry. Where we decide in advance what we want to do giving-wise is not the tithe. And by the way, we've mentioned this already. The tithe was brought into the New Testament for sure. Uh, here's the hinge that connects the two, 1 Corinthians 9, 14. Just like the, pre the priests of the Old Covenant, even so, Paul says, the Lord has commanded, not suggested, that those who preach the gospel should live of it. Galatians 6, 6 says the same thing. The one that's taught the word should communicate or share with the one teaching. And I like this one. It's just, I'm glad it's in there. You know, 1 Corinthians 5, 17. If there's a preacher or teacher, wherever he or she is, whatever kind of ministry, and they're really laboring in that, they ought to get a double dip. They ought to get a double pay, according to Paul. Most preachers I know are trying to get the first one, but still in all, I'm glad it's in there. Now, we, we decide in our own heart for ourselves in advance how we want to help somebody. Not out of grief. Everybody say grief. Leapy. That, that means remorse, you know, to be sad. How many have heard of giver's remorse? This one world-class preacher, I get the biggest kick out of him. He often tells stories about how he first learned to give. And I think he had gotten a royalty check, and it, it amounted to like five grand. And one grand after another, the Lord kept telling him to sow his, his royalty check, you know. And he said at one point, he said to the Lord, he said, now I just, I don't know whether you understand, I'm down to my last thousand on this, out of this $5,000 royalty check, you know. I guess the Lord didn't get the memo, so he wanted to make it clear. Are you sure you're telling me to give the last one away? And he did, and some amazing things happened. But the idea is we're not supposed to have giver's remorse. This is not something that we should we should feel bad about when we sow into somebody's life. Or of necessity, and that's a real interesting word. It just simply means compulsion or something you or I would do out of a debt. So when we sow into someone's life, when the opportunity presents itself to bless a believer, we should not do it feeling sad about it. If we're feeling sad about it, there's something wrong. Um, more than likely, our faith isn't where it's supposed to be yet. We're still feeling like we have to take care of ourselves because if we don't, uh, no one else will, and, including God. There's probably, probably something that needs to get sorted out there. In any case, we shouldn't be giving out of sadness, nor out of necessity. We shouldn't feel like, well, bless God, you know, I don't, man, I, I don't want to lose out on a blessing, you know, so-and-so need, needs something, and, you know, I, could, I don't want to do it, but, you know, on the other hand, I don't want to go to hell over a hundred bucks, you know, I, I actually heard somebody talking in a church that I pastored, one to, to the other, said, uh, now, do we, do we, this is tithing, do we tithe on the net or the gross? You know, the fellow says, well, here's what I look at. I wouldn't want to go, to go to hell for a couple hundred bucks. Wow. <laughs> I, I heard that with my, with, my, with my, I'm thinking, if you got to figure out whether you can get by with the net or the gross, just stop right there and, and think it through again, what's going on here with the tithing. Anyway, so it shouldn't be out of grief, sadness, and it shouldn't be by compulsion. So what it's really saying is it shouldn't be spur of the moment. This is how some Christians get involved with giver's remorse. They go to some meeting and, and one of the, you know, the 
helpers gets everybody fired up into a frenzy about helping somebody or some new ministry outreach, and, and, and they just start signing the check away before they even think, and then after it, oh, <laughs> what have I done, you know? Shouldn't be that. Should think in advance before you get involved. And really, I think the principle applies to tithing too, or you know, doing something more than a tithe for a ministry or for a ministry outreach. Same idea. Shouldn't be. It shouldn't be emotion based or spur of the moment, and it shouldn't be coerced. Have you ever been in a meeting where the pastor tells a big long sob story about how he's going to hell in a handbasket? The church is too. The sky's falling. You know, and take the offering. I've actually seen this done, and they collect the offering. We didn't get enough. They send her around again, and maybe send her around again. I remember one meeting I was at. Uh, someone had stolen the guest speaker's CDs or, or tapes, whatever he was hawking that night. I was there. I heard this. I happened to know that the man was a millionaire. And you know that the pastor took three or four offerings so that they could make up the amount of money that this millionaire lost by not being able to hawk his, his uh, cassettes. That didn't excite me. I didn't get involved in that second offering, you know, knowing this guy's already a millionaire. I thought it should, well, I won't go there. Anyway, we need to understand how this thing works. Well, if we're not going to give sadly, you know, with grief, if we're not going to give out of compulsion, feeling like, well, I got to do this or else, then how should I give? How should I sow into somebody's, uh, somebody's life? Uh, in faith and out of love. For, look at it, for God is loving a cheerful giver. That's a beautiful word, ilaron. You know what that means? It's the word we get our word hilarious from. So in other words, we should feel happy when we sow into somebody's life. Have you ever had God put somebody on your heart and you felt like you're, you felt like you're supposed to sow something? And when you do it, it's such a nice feeling, isn't it? I mean, there's no sadness to it. You're not thinking about them, you know, tit for tat or something, them do, doing something for you. You just feel really good. You release it. You think, wow, this is awesome. I don't know what this can become in that person's life. Who knows? You know, just like the seed of a word, internet. Who knew, you know, not quite 20 years later, We've almost influenced 20,000 people, and that's just the, the, the people that are taking the course. Multiply that by 100 at least, or 250 or more, probably because uh, most of our people are ministers, at least half. Um, and so they're, they're, they're touching more than 100 or 250 people significantly in their lifetime. We can't have any idea how many that is. But it all started with a seed, the seed of a word. And that's something. And, you know, when I think about this, how we don't want to fall for hard luck stories or sob stories or feel obligated, et cetera, et cetera. It ought to be out of a loving heart, a happy heart. I forgive the personal reference, but this is, you know, I think real life. I think back to when I was working uh, at, at a Christian radio station. That was my job. And then I was evangelizing through the week, uh, weeknights and Sundays, et cetera, et cetera. And I wasn't making a lot of money. I wasn't making money, much money at my job either. But I would tie to my local church, of course. And then I would try to finagle. I can see it just while I'm talking to you. I can see myself in the living room of our little apartment. And after I got things sorted out, the bills pay this and that, I have so much money left over. And I would try to finagle. How can, I, how can I squeeze some more money out to send to my mentor's ministry? You know, I just, this guy had changed my life, you know. And I thought, man, I just wish I could, I could do more. And I just did what I could. But I felt great about it. There was absolutely no remorse. I felt no obligation, no debt, no compulsion. It was just something I wanted to do. And I think that illustrates what we're talking about. So there's the secret of the seed. Here's the good stuff. The success of the seed. This is where it gets really, really beautiful. Just want to remind us, the whole concept of sowing and reaping is a law that began operating in the very beginning. Do you remember when God created the herbs and so on? Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, they, they, he created them with seed. And so out of one plant would come seeds that would bring forth more and more plants. And I wish I had some uh, illustrations with me tonight. I don't. But you've probably heard about a pumpkin, one pumpkin, and the seeds in there will create how many other pumpkins. You know, it's just kind of mind, mind boggling. But it's the, it's the law of sowing and reaping. Even after the first judgment, after the flood, we read in Genesis 8.22, as long as there are seasons on planet Earth, among other things, there will be seed time and harvest, or sowing and reaping with the germination time in between. Uh, in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus spoke of the same principle regarding you, regarding me, regarding all believers bringing forth fruit. 
if you haven't read it in a while, Matthew 13, 23. He describes all believers, the elect, the chosen, the sons of God. He, he describes us as having heart soil of an understanding heart that when the seed is sown in our lives, it brings forth fruit, 30, 60, 100. If you read the rest of the parable, you understand he's talking primarily about salvation and you and I influencing people for the kingdom of God. And we bring forth fruit and there are st stages to it. Now along that same line, actually in verse 38 of the same parable, he talks about us being seed not only is the word sown in our heart causing us to be saved and then hopefully to let that rub off on somebody else, but we ourselves are also seed sown into the world to be light, to be salt, to be that city set on a hill once again so the people that are outside the kingdom uh, can hear the word and hopefully receive it. Something else I think we need to think about, it's not always mentioned, is this timing factor between sowing and reaping. You very rarely reap the same day you sow, very rarely, especially in the natural. So there's a, there's a time factor. And actually, that, that can apply even to tithing as well as just giving into the lives of other people that are in need. There's often a, a, a timing factor that we're not always aware of if the Lord doesn't show us. Paul spoke about that in Galatians 6. And I want to remind us that I'm not pulling scriptures out of context. In Galatians 6, he's talking about money again. But there, he's not talking about giving to the poor. He's talking about the tithe or supporting the ministry. Let him who's taught the word uh, minister to the teacher in every good thing. And then here, here's the end of that, Galatians 6, 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. And there's an article before well-doing, the well-doing. So it's a particular kind of good work, a particular kind of of giving uh, to the ministry. Let us not be weary in the well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we're not feigning. So the idea is we don't just cast our bread on the water and forget about it. We expect it to come back multiplied. If, it, if we didn't, our, our, our ability to support and to give would, would soon come to an end. God's got to replace what we're letting go of or we're, gonna, we're not going to be giving anything. But notice that due season. And I'm not a farmer by any stretch of the imagination, but um, I mean, common sense tells us everything that grows has a different seed time. Uh, animals have a different gestation time when they're uh, bearing their young, etc. Horses, uh, 11 months, is it, Barb? Yeah, 11 months for a horse and maybe three months for a cat, something like that. All different. Uh, the, the seed sown, two, what is it? Yeah, yeah, right. I think it's about three months. I'm not sure. But in any case, same concept in both cases, the seed sown, but there's a different gestation time, germination time, and then the reaping, the little foal uh, or the, uh, the kitten. Um, and then I've already mentioned uh, the, this is actually part of a lifestyle, Galatians 6, 7. Stop being deceived. God is not mocked. You know, don't think you can turn your nose up at God when he says you need to get involved in giving, whether it's support of the ministry or helping other Christians in need. Uh, Whatsoever a man is sowing, that and that alone shall he reap. Um, for he that is sowing to his own flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. The unsaved person is not going to find life in this world or the next. But he that is sowing to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap eternal life. And we've already seen you're going to be blessed in this life and you're going to be blessed in the life to come. So here's the success of the seed now. Here it is. Listen to what Paul says after he's outlined how we should give, how we should sow, how we should share, how we should open our heart and hand to other people. For God is able to make every grace abound toward you. And I think of a conveyor belt with a lot of boxes, big boxes, you know, coming, and the, and the conveyor belt is coming toward you. It's not going past you to deliver the present to somebody else. In a perfect world, it's coming your way because you've gotten involved in the first half. You've decided to sow on blessings or to sow in the right attitude, to sow um, liberally, generously, so you know what you can expect to come back. Um, God is able to make every grace abound toward you 
Why? In order that always continually having all sufficiency in all things, you may be abounding to every good work. And this should go without saying, but you know, sometimes we need to be reminded of the obvious. This does not mean tit for tat. It does not mean when we give or sow, we're expecting a benefit back from the very person we're giving to. Well, I'll help you now, but now we, a month or two from now, when I'm, <laughs> I'm between the rock and the hard place, that's where you come in. That's when I'll be on the phone to you or tapping you out an email. No, it shouldn't be that way. We're, we're giving freely. We're giving with a cheerful heart. We're giving without sorrow, without feeling obligated. And we're letting it go. We're sowing it as seed, knowing that anything we hold on to will never get any bigger, that anything we release will never be any smaller. It'll just get bigger. And we're looking to the Lord to cause all grace to abound toward us. So we're not expecting it back from the person we're giving it to. We're expecting it back from the Lord. It's the Bible way. Amen? Now, I like this. Being a good New Testament scribe, Paul not only talks about what's going on in the present, but he reaches back into the Old Covenant about a thousand years roughly before his time and pulls out a verse of Scripture from his uh, Greek Old Testament, Psalm 112, verse 9. This is Paul's foundation or confirmation of what he's been saying. According as it stands written, he, speaking of the righteous person, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor ones, plural, his righteousness is abiding forever. What a good statement. You know, what a good character res a reference. What can you tell me about Sister Hopinetti? Oh, man, generous to a fault. Give you the shirt off her back. When you hear that, do you feel good about that person or do you want to avoid fellowship with them? You feel good about them, right? Actually, the line probably would start forming at the right, but... That's, well, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. Anywho, it's the Bible way doing this. This is God's way. And then here's the, closing, <clears throat> here's the closing comment he makes. And it's kind of a benediction or a blessing that you and I can receive for ourselves too, if we qualify. Not everybody does. Uh, i never forget a really wealthy man in one church I pastored, knew we were fixing to go on a mission trip. And uh, we were doing, doing some visiting there at his house and and had a little missionary party going with me, soloist and, a, and a, a worship leader, and this and that. And we talked about what we needed, and we told him how much the tickets were, and this and that. He said, well, the Lord will provide. On the way out, he just tapped us on the shoulder. You know, the Lord will provide. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know what, the pat on the back's okay, but I would really prefer something beyond the pat on the back. You know what? God did provide, but it wasn't through him. And so what happened? In his life, nothing. He didn't get a blessing. I've had people come in prayer lines, you know, with a financial need, and they, they, almost to a person, they never offer to sow any seeds. Not that I care. God takes care of us one way or another. But what about that person? If you give God nothing and ask him to multiply it, what will, he, what will you have? I, I mean, that you know, it's so ridiculous, but it's so profound. We give God nothing and say, would you please multiply this for me? What, what's he going to multiply? Nothing. And there again, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Stop deceiving yourself. And we do it all the time. Well, one thing about it, it's my money. Yeah, I know the tithe's supposed to go to God's, God's church, God's ministry. But, you know, I feel like I'd rather, I'd rather give a sister a hoop and diddle, you know, because she's got a flat tire and I feel like she needs it more in the church. Well, you know what? It says who? We don't have any control over our tithe, or we shouldn't. God tells us exactly what the tithe's for. And he got really upset when the people weren't tithing because there wasn't food in his house. That didn't, you know, didn't mean that, that he wants to decorate his house with lamb chops and this and that. That went to the, to the ministry so they wouldn't starve. Anywho, here's the benediction. If we qualify, this isn't for everybody. This is for people that decide to give, not with sadness, not feeling obligated or under compulsion, but they understand this, that it's a privilege. Um, Here's the, here's the benediction. Now to the one continually supplying seed to the one sowing and bread for eating, may he supply and may he multiply your sowing and may he increase the fruits of your righteousness. 
This is actually an allusion to Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10. And what it's really saying is it's all God from start to finish. You and I would never be able to sow anything of any kind into anyone's life if God didn't put it in our hand. You know, my mentor, bless his heart, he liked to write books. He almost couldn't start, couldn't stop writing. I think he wrote like 600 books. He'd be, out in the, he'd be out in the evangelistic trail. His wife would be driving. He'd be in the passenger side. He'd take his new shirt out of, the, out of the box and take the shirt off the little cardboard. And he'd be writing real small, real small words with a pen, ink pen, writing a book on that cardboard from when his shirt came in. And uh, he mentioned one of his books, one of his educated friends. I'm going to write a book one of these days. But he was one of these people that felt like it had to be perfect. So year after year went on, decade after decade, he never did get that book written. But my mentor said, I just, cont- I, just, I just plunged in in my averageness. And uh, by the time he was done, he'd written 600 books, and the big shot, the smart fella, did, hadn't written one. And what did he do? He sowed. He sowed what was in his life. Now, I'm only one person. I think something like 70 million books uh, of his are around the world. I'm only one person, but he significantly impacted my life. And so that seed that he sowed is continuing to bear fruit and will continue to do it. This is crazy. And he's been gone for over 30 years. Uh, He's been upstairs, but he's still collecting. Isn't that kind of cool, isn't it? Talk about residuals. I got an actor friend, you know, he says he likes to look to go to the mailbox. There's a, there's a check for a movie he was in 10 years ago. He said, all oh, residuals, they're fun, you know. Can you imagine the spiritual residuals when you and I sow into somebody's life and it, it gets multiplied? But if, and this we're, we're closing tonight, but I, wanted to, I want you to look at this. Isaiah 55, he, Paul alludes to this in his benediction and his blessing to the one continually supplying seed to the one sowing and bread for eating. May he supply and may he multiply your sowing and may he increase the fruits of your righteousness. Listen to, listen to what the text actually says, Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Isn't that something? God speaks, and it has an effect on planet earth. It does what he wants it to do. God sent the word of salvation, and what? We're here along with another billion or so people on planet Earth in this generation alone because of the power and the success of the seed being sown, in that case, words. It's, it's just absolutely amazing. We're here tonight in this fellowship because of the seed of a word I got when I was driving to a meeting out toward the outback of Australia. And I had a, I had a vision of a church, and the Lord told me what it was going to do and where we, where we, where we were going to kind of plan it and this and that. And 30 plus years later, here we are, still here. And the, the, in the vision, part of the vision I had was this big, tall, almost like a radio tower, beams of light or li- lightning going out all over the world. And if you'd have told me when we planted this full gospel independent church here, we planted it because there wasn't any independent full gospel church in this area when we planted this church. When we did that, if you'd have told me that, I'd have probably, well, maybe, you know, couldn't think of how that could possibly happen. Not only would we touch people here and around the tri-state, but all across America and now 165 countries. It just kind of boggles the mind when we had no backing behind us, when we're the wrong denomination for this area, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm saying that to brag on God and on the power of his word. If God says something, it's going to happen. Amen. Uh, around that same time, I had had a, a dream that I would pastor another church before this one that I was told to plant. And when I came back from overseas, long story short, I was invited to rescue a church that was in trouble. And they had uh, had their eye on a building, a new building. And I walked in, looked around. It was exactly the building that I'd seen 
in, while I was in Sydney, Australia, 10,000 miles away, before I knew anything about them, even thinking about getting a new building. Talk about feeling pretty comfortable. The seed was sown, I received it, and I acted on it, didn't have to, and uh, things went pretty well and, and, uh, until people dropped the ball, and then they didn't go so well, but things worked out as long as uh, people were cooperating with the word. So, you know, whether we're talking about words or talent or finance, material support, support for the ministry, support for poor folks within the body, whatever you want, anything that we're giving, that we're releasing, that we're sending out, there's a law of sowing and reaping, and there will be a, a germination time, but the reaping does come. And in terms of, the, of finance, I personally think it's kind of exciting because as far as I can tell from the scripture, there's no lid on it. Well, it only works till you get your first $100,000 back from your giving. There's no lid. So it's kind of exciting. You, you, we can kind of decide, not in a proud way, just because the Lord has said this is the way it works, we can sort of decide how much blessing do I want in this life and then in the next life? How much can I handle so we can tithe? Uh, believe it or not, some people do more than tithing. You're not going to believe that. <laughs> some people aren't trying to figure it to grows to the net. Um, they do more than that. We can decide what we want to do. And helping somebody else, we can decide. God told me to help this person. Hmm. We can decide how much, which determines how much will come back, which determines how much more we can give, etc. Isn't that kind of cool? So, to me, it's a really nice cycle of blessing. And uh, I think these are, you know, these are nice principles, and they're things we can kind of count on. They work. They're like gravity. Uh, it's just something that's set up. As long as there's, you know, winter, summer, there'll be seed time and harvest till, till he changes things. Anybody questions on this tonight at all? See the difference between support of the ministry, giving that we decide? I hope so. People mix scriptures up, you know. They decide, well, I'll bless God. I don't, you know, believe in tithing. I'll just give whatever I take a notion. It's good to sort things out. Anybody? Anyone? Anywhere? Cool. Cool beaners. So we're going to go into the Lord's Supper in just a minute. If you're giving, speaking of money, that's great. Um, wrap your seat with faith. There's some baskets here, one in the hallway. And thank God the Lord's looking after us. Amen. Amen. He's wonderful.